And uh, as I said uh, just a moment ago, uh, feel free to jump in with any questions because uh, when I'm going through the notes, I have to minimize your images so I can't see you. So don't just raise your hand, just pipe right in, just say, excuse me or something. And we'll address any questions in real time, okay? I just wanna make sure uh, there are no lingering questions. Okay, so we, we ended here last time with an interpretation of this torsion tensor as essentially, excuse me, uh, the dislocation density. My computer is acting funny. There we go. So this um, object we called the dislocation density, which was um, involved curl, the referential curl of K inverse, the inverse plastic deformation gradient, and K inverse itself and then its determinant, all that can boil down to this representation. Contravariant components given in terms of this permutation uh, tensor refer to this intermediate state we mentioned, <clears throat> and the torsion tensor existing in this intermediate state. And we can invert this relationship to get the torsion in terms of the dislocation density. So dislocation density is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the torsion. <coughs> so you can see now why the geometry associated with the plastic deformation is inherently non-Euclidean because it is associated with a, a connection, a set of connection symbols, the gamma hat on top, which are are not symmetric in the lower subscripts and that the skew part of that object is the torsion which is non-zero because um, precisely because the plastic deformation is in general not a gradient and that that is fundamental that property is fundamental to defining a Berger's vector associated with the dislocation distribution and so on <coughs> as we've seen Okay, um, I mentioned that this torsion tensor or dislocation density uh, has the effect of causing the elastic strain to be incompatible. <clears throat> Let's see how that works. Um, recall that the elastic part of the deformation gradient we defined this way, Fk, which is another way of writing F is Fe, Fp, where Fe is H and Fp is K inverse. We just write, we read it this way. <clears throat> F we remember from what we've done before as this representation in a convected coordinate system, the natural basis in the current configuration, dual basis in the reference. K has this representation from the last lecture, natural basis in the <coughs> reference configuration, dual basis in the intermediate state so that well, making the multiplication gives us a Kronecker delta ij from this term. Carry out the sum on j and you just get this. So this has the structure exactly the same as this, except we, we replace the referential dual basis by the intermediate dual basis. So we can make a Cauchy-Green deformation, an elastic Cauchy-Green deformation tensor based on h in the usual way. And multiply the transpose of this with itself and you get gi dot gj which gives us the metric in the current configuration but expressed in the dual basis of the intermediate configuration so the elastic strain which uh, we've already introduced then is this take the cauchy green deformation tensor based on the elastic part of the deformation gradient subtract the identity put the half in front and we get this representation in terms of covariant components referred to the intermediate dual basis. <clears throat> so the elastic strain, just like very similar to the, the actual total strain, is the difference of the metrics, current relative minus intermediate with a half in front. Um, let's call that E sub small e to, to, rem to remind us that's the elastic part. <clears throat> The elastic strain. Well, we put that right here, and we notice that to get the total strain, which I'm now writing as E 
not, not to be confused with this E, which is E elastic. This is the total covariant strain in a convected coordinate system. I can write that as this if I just put, I just I just add in the one half mij and subtract the capital gij. This is an identity, right? So this would be this would be our covariant plastic strain. You compare the intermediate to the reference. That would be so-called plastic strain. <clears throat> so we have an additive decomposition of the strain, but not quite. This is only valid for covariant components in a convected coordinate system. If you were try if you would if you were to form from this the strain tensor, you would multiply these covariant components by the dual basis in the reference configuration, which would then pass through to both terms on the right hand side. You would not then get a decomposition of the strain tensor into an elastic strain tensor plus a plastic strain tensor. <clears throat> but interestingly, you get a, an additive decomposition is exactly correct, but only for covariant components. <coughs> so you may have heard some of you, if you've been studying plasticity here and there, about additive decompositions of the strain tensor into elastic and plastic parts. That's, that's literally only true for covariant components, not for the tensors themselves. And even then, only when using a convected coordinate system. The, the general decomposition is this, which is F is F elastic times F plastic, which is K inverse. Later on, <clears throat> we will talk about the small deformation theory, which is uh, a good setting for solving problems. And it's also very technologically relevant, the small, small deformation theory, in which we will show that approximately, it's approximately true that the, the strain tensor can be written as the elastic strain tensor plus the plastic strain tensor. But that's, that statement is not true for the strain tensors in the general finite deformation case. So this is a, a source of potential, you know, serious confusion. This is an identity only for covariant components, not for the tensors themselves. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a, a bit of an aside. Um, as far as compatibility is concerned, we have these levi civita connection coefficients from last time in the intermediate state, right? These are the, <clears throat> We, we ran out of notation, so we reverted back to the old, old-fashioned curly bracket notation for the ledvi chavita connection based on the metric Mij and its partial derivatives. <clears throat> well, that levi chavita connection then goes into forming the connection associated with the intermediate state. And we had a complicated formula for it from last time. Let's just quickly revisit it, if I can go back here. Here it is. Um, the connection associated, connection symbols associated with the intermediate state are given in part by the Levi Civita part here, curly bracket, and the rest of it involves some complication involving the torsion tensor. <clears throat> okay, but we know. that the connection gamma hat furnishes us with a zero riemann christoffel curvature. If you look at page 62, the way we created this gamma hats was based on a dot product of the dual basis m super k with m sub i comma j, right? And any such connection delivers a zero value for the riemann tensor. So the, so the levi civita component, the part of that connection, the curly bracket part, if you, can, if you constructed a Riemann tensor based solely on that, you would not get zero. <clears throat> you do, however, get a zero Riemann tensor based on this gamma hat connection. So let's see if we can exploit that. So go back to your notes, page 62, if you want to refresh on that. I want to get a condition here on, on this. I want to interpret this condition, zero Riemann tensor based on gamma hat, in terms of the elastic strain. 
So what would I do? Well, I can plug this Mij, which I can solve this equation for Mij in terms of the elastic strain and the current metric, like here, plug it into the expression for the levy chivita connection. Then, with that in hand, plug it in to the expression for gamma hat we've just reviewed a moment ago. And we get this gamma hat in terms of the current metric, the elastic strain, and the torsion. Put that expression then, which is going to be fairly complicated, put it into <clears throat> this condition, the Riemann tensor based on gamma hat equals zero. Now, previously, we indicated that this condition is equivalent to this fully covariant Riemann Christoffel tensor being zero, where this all we do is to drop an index using the, met, the, the metric in the intermediate configuration as we did previously, okay? So the vanishing of this object here is equivalent to the vanishing of this object because M is invertible, right? <clears throat> okay, if you look back a little bit in your notes, we've essentially done the computation to establish a formula for this fully covariant Riemann tensor. Look back on page 56. That's given in this way, in terms of the index lowered connection symbols gamma hat, which are defined exactly in terms of these by dropping the index using the metric small m. Exactly the same calculation. <clears throat> so we want this object to be zero, right? And we also know this, this involves the metric G sub ij. We also know that because, I mean, that's the metric associated with the current configuration, that sits in Euclidean space. And so the Riemann tensor based on the levy chivita connection computed from Gij is equal to zero. <clears throat> okay? So what we will obtain is, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking you through basically one of your next homework assignments for next, that I'll give you next week. What we arrive at from this procedure are restrictions involving the current metric, the elastic strain, and the derivatives, and the torsion. <clears throat> what you will find from that procedure is that if the torsion is not zero, which means the body is dislocated, which it generally will be if you have a plastic deformation, then it's impossible to have the elastic strain field being identically zero everywhere in the body. <clears throat> You can have a condition involving the derivatives of this counterbalanced by the torsion. <clears throat> so if this were identically zero, then all those derivatives would be zero and the, the equation that we're talking about enforcing, namely this one, would not be satisfied. So it's impossible to have an elastic strain field that's identically zero in the body, therefore, from the constitutive equation, the, the, we, we talked about a strain energy density, right? And obtained from it a second piola kirchhoff stress using the intermediate state as the reference. So if the elastic strain is non-zero, that second piola kirchhoff stress cannot be zero everywhere in the body. And this, this then tells you <clears throat> that there must be a stress generated in response to torsion or dislocation density. And that you can think of is that that's the st a stress that arises in response to the constraint that the body, the dislocated body actually sits in Euclidean space. The, f the, the deformed state of a dislocated body sits in Euclidean space. So you can think of this as like reaction stresses almost, that the, the body must produce in order to fit the body back into Euclidean space. So <clears throat> for this reason, you know, the, the, in continuum mechanics, we often, in a lecture or a course, we say, well, let's look at a stress-free reference configuration. Well, how do you get a reference configuration? Well, you'd, normally you take it to be the initial configuration of some part or piece of a, that somebody hands you that piece has probably been manufactured in a way that involves prior plastic deformation, you know, metal forming processes, 
you know, you're, you're bending uh, sheet panels into automobile body panels and so on. Those processes, of actual manufacturing processes, will involve a plastic deformation as part of the process, typically. So the, that, that, the configuration that you would like to choose then as a reference configuration is undoubtedly not stress-free. So in continuum mechanics, when we talk about choosing a stress-free reference configuration, that's really a fiction. It's a fantasy. It's, uh, it's, dif it's difficult to achieve in practice. Uh, you, could do, you could do things like anneal the, anneal the material, you know, raise it up to a, a high enough temperature so the material recrystallizes effectively into a, a, a stress-free, more or less stress-free state. But that's normally not something you would do for the sake, merely for the sake of analysis, right? You wouldn't do that in practice. It would be, uh, it would be <clears throat> you know, not, not part of your normal uh, process of, anal of stress analysis. Okay, so the upshot here is plastically deformed bodies are inherently stressed. Okay, um, so what I've just described to you, which is a preview of your upcoming homework, sounds kind of complicated, <clears throat> and it's a little bit complicated, true. We have s something going for us, however. If we want to impose r hat the Riemann tensor equals zero, we can exploit the fact that it's skew in the second, in the in the in the third and fourth subscripts, right? The second pair of uh, subscripts. And that comes from the definition of the Riemann tensor that we started with. So we have that going for us. The symmetric part in, the, in this second pair of subscripts is, is zero anyway. It's identically zero. <clears throat> but we, have, we can actually do more than that. We can assert that we also have a symmetry with respect to the first pair of subscripts, or, that, that, or, or either a skew symmetry. The symmetric part in the, in, the, in the first pair of subscripts is also identically equal to zero. So here, the symmetric part in the, part in the second pair of subscripts is identically zero. Turns out the same is true for the first pair of subscripts. We didn't touch on that before. Uh, actually, we only touched that, we did touch on that before in the case of zero torsion, right? But it, it turns out it's even true now in the, when we do have torsion. And let's, let's pause for a moment just to run through a, a derivation of that. I'll just run through it lightly because there are lots of indices to keep track of and you can always verify this offline for yourselves. So I want to verify that the symmetric part of RPM LJ is, the symmetric part in P and M is zero. So I add RPM to RMP, don't touch anything else. And of course, this then, is one half of this, so I don't, I don't worry about the half at this stage. Look at the R, the, the fully covariant R I had on the previous screen. Right, write, write that down. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where was it? Here it is. Put this into this condition. So write down the RPM LJ as I've just had it, then interchange M and P and add them together. I'll get this complication here on the right-hand side. If you look back on page 55 now, this involves the index lowered connection symbols. I can write that in terms of partial derivatives of the metric here, the small m, like so. And I have a combination like here, PMJ comma L plus MPJ comma L. Using this, this is immediately given by the metric sub MP comma JL. So this line and this line are not so bad. They combine to give you this skew symmetrized part of the second derivatives of the metric in J and L. So this two times the symmetrized part is just the left hand side here that I've been talking about. However, I've got the rest of these, the, the, the third and fourth lines left over, with them repeating down here. Let's have a look, for example, at this 
term here in the second line, I, P, L, I, M, J. That's the, the I, M, J is the same as metric I, N, gamma super N, M, J, and then carry the I, P, L. I could use the same trick to, instead of lowering the index here, I could lower it over here using the sum on I to get an gamma N, P, L, super N, M, J. N is a dummy index, so I can rewrite it as an I, I, M, J, I, P, L, which is exactly the same as this term. So this term cancels, this second term on the second line cancels with the first term on the third line. And in the same exact way, this first term in the second line cancels with the last term in the third line. So everything drops out except this. But if you have a metric that's a C2 function of the coordinates, you can interchange these second order partial derivatives so that the skew symmetrized partial derivative is identically zero. And that establishes this property that I set out to demonstrate. <clears throat> So taken together with the result we had to, at the beginning, which comes immediately from the definition of the Riemann tensor, that means the Riemann tensor is skew in the first pair and also the separate pair separately, right? So we can write it, it can put a skew operation around PM and a skew operation around LJ. Now, if you look back on page 57, we use that, that fact and that alone to establish that the Riemann tensor is equivalent to this second order tensor. We call it pi, so we'll call it pi hat to go with r hat. And I'm using the permutation tensor associated with the intermediate because everything here is associated with the intermediate state. Okay, so using only this condition, we establish that r, th this is just a definition, but it's invertible. We established that r hat is equivalent to pi hat. So saying that r hat is zero is equivalent to the much simpler statement that pi hat is zero, which is a second order tensor equation instead of a fourth order one. So that's a, an enormous saving in, in, uh, in the analysis. <clears throat> There's a, a fly in the ointment though, which is that now, our torsion in this geometry is not zero. If you look back on page 56, we established this major symmetry of the Riemann tensor for, con for con using connections with zero torsion. That the zero torsion, the symmetry of the connection coefficients in the subscripts played a major role in establishing the major symmetry of the Riemann tensor. But now we have a non-zero torsion, so that's no longer true. So we don't have that. Now, back when we had zero in, in a geometry with zero torsion, we established that the associated pi tensor was symmetric. And that's why we have six conditions of compatibility to deal with. But now we don't have that major symmetry which led to the symmetry of pi. So it seems that pi is not symmetric. So now we have nine equations of compatibility, apparently, instead of only six, which sounds like a problem because we only have six elastic strain components. Let's see if we can dig our way out of that, out of that problem. So let's make a, a, an inventory of the equations that we have. We have nine equations involving the current metric, which will control by demanding that the Riemann tensor in the current configuration is zero. That's six variables. So that, that will be taken care of, these will be taken care of by these six equations based on the compatibility conditions in the current configuration, six equations. Uh, six strain components, and we have nine torsion components, right? Because for each K, this is skew and I and J. So for if you fix K, you have three, you have a skew matrix, which is three numbers. And that we have three of those because K runs from one to three, so we have nine altogether. 
Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so it looks, on the face of it, we have these nine equations we have to solve. However, we can show with a little bit of effort, which I'm gonna ask you to do next week, that three of these nine equations corresponding to the skew part of pi i j, the skew symmetrized part, if this is zero, then the skew part is zero, right? If you just take the skew part of this equation, you get this. Likewise, if you take the symmetric part, you also get zero. So three of these equations turn out to be identically satisfied. In other words, they just boil down to zero equals zero. And here I've got an, an asterisk footnote. In your homework, you'll show that those three equations I've just mentioned, the skew part of this pi ij, pi hat pi ij, are equivalent to this vector equation, the curl, the transpose of the curl of K inverse, which we used to define the referential dislocation density tensor, if you remember, which is simply, if you, if you look at what we did last time, that's, you can show that that's equal to this in terms of the torsion tensor, referential permutation, referential natural basis, intermediate, basis. You can establish this easily yourselves. The, the, that's the curl of K inverse. It turns out that there's a, a nice identity which you can easily prove, which is analogous to the vector identity. You've all heard of the idea that the divergence of the curl of a vector is identically zero. Right? That's an identity. You can prove the same for the extension to tensors. For example, for a second order tensor, the curl of A is a second order tensor, take its transpose and take the conventional divergence of that here in spatial coordinates, let's say, you'll get an identity. You get this is identically zero. So offline, you, could, you should quickly prove this to yourself, say using Cartesian coordinates. <clears throat> well, the skew part of pi hat ij equals zero turns out to be equivalent to this. And this is an identity. This is identically zero. So it's not like we have to solve these equations. They'll be identically satisfied by virtue of this identity. So what I'm gonna ask you to show in homework is that those equations are equivalent to these equations or alternatively equivalent to this spatial divergence of the spatial curl of the dislocation density referred to the current configuration, which you can show is equal to this, is identically zero. So after all that, the, the nine equations really become th uh, six because three of them are identities. And those six equations then will furnish six restrictions on the elastic strain, which will involve the torsion. And these will lead you to conclude that it's impossible to have an elastic strain field that's identically zero. And hence, <clears throat> Following our earlier discussion, a, dis, a, a plastically deformed body will, must be stressed, even if you don't have any loads acting on the body. Okay. okay, so that's the end of this set of notes. Um, let me see, I'm gonna stop sharing this and see if I can instead share something else. It's the next set. Um, Okay, go back to screen share. There they are. Okay, <clears throat> now in all that discussion that we've uh, gone through, in particular when we define uh, the Burgers vector and the dislocation density in terms of Stokes theorem, we assumed that the, the plastic deformation was continuous in the body. Plastic deformation G, or equivalently the inverse of K, was continuous in the body. It turns out that a, a discontinuous K field or G field has some 
very interesting uh, implications. A, a so-called discontinuous plastic deformation field leads us to the notion called a surface dislocation. So let's see if we can uh, undertake that discussion. So imagine I have a plastic deformation field, G or K inverse equivalently, which can have a discontinuity across some surface. I'll call it S. That surface does not have to be a material surface. Say we're, say we're in the reference configuration. So this surface S does not have to be a material surface. That is, S could move rel within the reference configuration. Remember, a material surface is something that's fixed, independent of time, in the reference configuration. A non-material surface can move relative to the reference configuration. Although in this discussion, <coughs> Uh, its evolution, the, the movements of that surface is not going to be relevant at the moment, but later on it will be. So we'll imagine that we have uh, a, a, a plastic deformation field, K inverse or G, which has a discontinuity across a surface S. And we'll interpret that later on physically. Uh, what I want to do is apply Stokes' theorem to a material surface, or we'll call it S perpendicular here. So this material surface, this cap, it looks like a cap here, is fixed in the reference configuration. I can choose that material surface arbitrarily, take an arbitrary material surface. S itself could be evolving relative to the reference configuration. But let's fix attention at a, on a particular time t, then s is fixed at that time. And let's select a material surface as perpendicular, which has the property of intersecting my discontinuity surface orthogonally, right? Give, you give me any s, any discontinuity surface at a particular instant in time, I can certainly find an infinity of material surfaces that are orthogonal to it, that is intersected orthogonally. So let's say N then is the unit normal to the discontinuity surface. N perpendicular is the unit normal to the material surface that intersects it orthogonally at, the, at that time T. So S perpendicular is a material surface it's, it, that material surface is split in two parts by the discontinuity surfaces, a part say S, S perpendicular plus and a part S perpendicular minus, right? So S perpendicular is the union of those two parts. Its boundary, which is the outside edge here of this material surface, is the union of these outside pieces, DS perpendicular plus, and ds perpendicular minus, and s and s perpendicular intersect in some curve here, I'm calling it gamma. So I hope the picture is reasonably clear. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the notation t for this n perpendicular. t because it's tangent, it's in the tangent plane to the discontinuity surface at this point, say at this point x, right? The reason it's in the tangent plane to that discontinuity surface is because n and n perpendicular are perpendicular to each other. Therefore, since n is the normal to s, n perpendicular is tangential to s at this point. So I'll just call it t to remind me myself that it's tangential. So, Let's say I want to, for the purpose of implementing Stokes' theorem on this material surface, I want to construct a dx vector along this intersection curve gamma. I can do that by taking a cross product of n with this, this thing I'm now calling t. That gives me a unit vector in, the, in this direction here. And then if I say u is arc length along that direction, then dx would be that unit vector, n dot t times du. 
Okay. So I'll use this formula in the expression for Stokes theorem, which we're, we're getting to. <clears throat> so we'll write dx in this manner on the, on the curve gamma, which is the intersection of the discontinuity surface with this material surface I've chosen to be perpendicular to it at this instant in time. Any questions before we uh, proceed? <clears throat> it's a lot to take in. Okay, so S has the property that it supports a non-zero discontinuity. That is to say, this, this bracket here, <coughs> this, this double bracket notation, I'll, I'll, I'll use that notation to stand for the discontinuity evaluated on S. That is to say, when you approach, say you have a plastic deformation, defined on this part S plus. The limit of it as you approach the discontinuity solid, kappa inverse sub plus. And plastic deformation, a K inverse field on this part, the other side of the discontinuity surface, its limit as you approach this curve gamma on the discontinuity surface we'll call K inverse sub minus. And if if k inverse is discontinuous, then this difference will be non-zero, right? Of course, if it's continuous, then there's no discontinuity. So by assumption, we have this bracket of k inverse non-zero on the discontinuity surface. And hence on this curve, which lies on the discontinuity surface, right? Okay, so now we're ready to apply Stokes theorem. Why? Because I want to I want to revisit my definition of Berger's vector that we had before, which pertains to a material surface. So each subsurface, S perpendicular plus and minus, is a subset of a material surface, and hence each by itself is a material surface. Let's apply Stokes theorem to it. Say so each one of them separately. Stokes theorem says that the integral over the area, S perpendicular plus, is curl K inverse all transpose, the normal, the normal uh, and perpendicular evaluated on this surface, VA, right? And that's integral, the integral over the entire bounding surface of S perpendicular plus. The bounding surface of that, of S plus, is dS plus right here, and also gamma, right? So we need contribution from gamma. Now that contribution will entail the interior limit on, of K inverse from the interior of the surface to that as you approach that, that curve. So that will bring in an interior limit from the plus region. So use a plus subscript. Then we have dx. Do the same thing for the other side of the material surface. And we bring in the minus limit. However, if we're going to use the single dx on gamma, then when we when we traverse so from, from, from the plus side, we're traversing gamma in this sense, sort of counterclockwise. From the minus side, we're traversing it like so, which is opposite to the sense of gamma that I've defined here, right? So I would use a, a different dx, the opposite of this dx, in traversing it, in, in implementing the Stokes theorem from the minus side, okay? So I, I would use the opposite of this dx, namely minus dx. So that it comes for the minus sign here. Okay, so you should review Stokes theorem uh, in, this, in regard to this discussion. So let's add these two left-hand sides together. Of course, the union of these subsurfaces is just the material surface as perpendicular. And I get this left-hand side. The union of these boundaries 
these parts of the boundary is just the boundary of that's perpendicular. <clears throat> then when I add these together, I get on, on gamma, I get the plus limit minus the minus limit, which is what I call this double square bracket. <clears throat> so that's the discontinuity. <clears throat> so this extends Stokes theorem from continuous tensor fields to, to per, tensor fields having a possible discontinuity al along uh, a curve. Right? Here on gamma to remind you, dx is n cross t du, where u is the arc length in the sense shown here, right, with the arrow increasing arc length going this way in the, in the direction of n cross t, n cross n perpendicular. Okay, so I'm jumping around. I don't want to make you dizzy. So k inverse dx, which sits in the integral here, is k inverse n cross t du. <clears throat> Let's imagine now fixing fixing the discontinuity surface. Right? We're, we can't play with the discontinuity surface because that's the that's the set of points where k inverse is discontinuous, and we're not at liberty to alter that. So let's fix n associated with a, disc, a given discontinuity surface. But we can always select the material surface that intersects it orthogonally in a completely arbitrary way. For example, we, instead of a, a cap, we could have a kind of inverse cap here. And the n perpendicular associated with that could be a completely different vector, right? Still tangential to the surface, but a completely different vector. In other words, we could choose the material surface that intersects it and, it, and hence choose n perpendicular, or t, in a completely arbitrary way, so long as it's in the tangent plane of the discontinuity surface. So we could legitimately fix n, the normal to the discontinuity surface, and, and consider this uh, combination for arbitrary unit vectors in the tangent plane of the discontinuity surface. So if we do that, we notice that this is a linear function of, of t, right? So for fixed n, this is a linear function of t just by inspection, which means there's a tensor, I'll call it beta sub r to go with reference configuration, which acts on t to produce this linear function of t. That's what we mean by a second order tensor. If you have a vector valued function that's a linear function of something like in this case t, then by definition there's a tensor that operates on that t whose value is that linear vector valued function. Effectively the definition of a tensor. Except it turns out to be convenient to put a transpose on the tensor for consistency with our earlier definition of Berger's vector. So I'll say that there's a, a tensor beta sub r transpose, which when acting on t must be equal to this. Why? Because this is a linear function of t. You don't need any more justification than that. Okay. And in fact, it's only the action of this tensor on t that matters. And t is an arbitrary unit vector in the tangent plane of the discontinuity surface at the particular point in question. So since it's the only the action on the tangent space that matters, we can impose that beta r has no, operates on the normal to produce zero. In other words, there's no component in the normal direction. Because if it did, let's say beta r the, the action of beta r transpose on n would have no effect on equation one. Okay, so it's, it's immaterial and we can set it equal to zero without losing any information. <clears throat> okay, so we can then, if we go back to our definition of Berger's vector, the Berger's vector associated with this material surface is the integral around the entire boundary of that material surface of the plastic deformation g or k inverse times dx. Right? But from this, the generalized Stokes theorem we now have, we have 
that, that integral, if let's go back, that's right here. So this thing is the Berger's vector that we defined before. That has this, that's equal to this part, which this was our alpha sub r transpose in perpendicular, minus this part, Let's see. Um, ah, so this part, this this part involves n cross t. I've defined the beta r in terms of t cross n, which is the minus n n cross t. So I've already embedded the minus sign in this definition of beta. So the total Burgess vector then is equal to the one we had the, the part we had before, which defined the referential dislocation density plus now this beta object, which accounts for the discontinuity in the plastic deformation. So from this equation, we see, and this is why they put the transpose on the definition so to go with the transpose here. <clears throat> so we see that a discontinuity, it's not just the curl of, not just the curl of the plastic deformation that contributes to the dislocation density, it's also the discontinuity in the plastic deformation, as defined here, that also contributes to the dislocation, the, to the, the net, the total overall Berger's vector. For that reason, here, here this is a, dis, a dislocation density per unit area. This is per unit length across the curve of, inter, of intersection between this and the discontinuity surface. So we'll call this the surface dislocation, so-called surface dislocation density, because it's associated with a surface on which the plastic deformation is discontinuous. Okay. <clears throat> we'll see uh, in, a, in a while that this beta actually has an important physical role to play. Okay, I'd like to characterize the beta in a way that's a bit cleaner than this. This equation is something that defines it as somewhat cumbersome. <clears throat> I'd like to use this equation to solve for beta or beta transpose. Um, to do that, remember T was an arbitrary unit vector in the tangent plane of the discontinuity surface at the point in question. Well, I can introduce a orthonormal set of unit vectors on the same tangent plane. And that orthonormal set of two vectors would then be a basis, an orthonormal basis for that tangent plane, right? So I could write the three-dimensional identity as the sum of the elements of an orthonormal basis in this way. T1, T2, and N, the normal to that discontinuity surface, form a three-dimensional orthonormal basis. So we can write the 3D identity in this way, where there's a sum now on alpha from one to two. This is T1 tensor product T1 plus T2 tensor, tensor product T2. And then you can think of N as being T3, for example. <clears throat> so I could write the jump in the, in the plastic deformation as itself times the identity, right? Write the identity in this form, and I get the jump in the plastic deformation operating on n, tensor product n, plus the jump operating on t alpha, tensor product t alpha. Let's give this vector a name, let's call it small k. <clears throat> um, let's see, here I need the jump on T1, for example, that's the jump on T1 is T2 cross N. If I, if I take T1 and T2 such that T1, 2, and N is a right-handed orthonormal basis, then T2 cross N, this be T2 cross T3 would just be T1. But if I look at the definition of beta from the top, if I put in T2 here, I get beta R transpose T2. Right, right there. Likewise, I'm going to need a jump on T2. 
T2 is minus T1 cross N because I'm choosing T1 and T2 to make this a right-handed orthonormal basis. And so from the same equation one, I get minus beta R transpose T1. So put that all together in here, you get jump in plastic deformation is this vector K tensor product, the normal to the discontinuity surface, then plus jump on T1, tensor product T1 plus jump on T2 times tensor product T2, I can write that in this way, minus beta R transpose epsilon N, where epsilon is T1, 2 minus T1. You can verify that quickly for yourselves. This, if you look at it, is nothing other than the, the two-dimensional permutation tensor associated with the tangent plane to the discontinuity surface. <clears throat> because this is an orthonormal basis, right? So the components would just be, the, the one, two component is one, the two, one component is minus one, and the two, two component is zero, and the one, one component is zero. That's just the uh, permutation tensor, two-dimensional permutation tensor, referred to an orthonormal basis on the tangent plane of the discontinuity surface. So you can, re you can write then the discontinuity in this way. What I'd like to do is isolate beta R transpose from this equation. So this is essentially a rewritten version of the original definition one. To do that, let's multiply on the right, both sides by this permutation. And I put the subscript N here to remind me myself that this is the tangent plane to a surface with normal n, okay? <clears throat> okay, if I multiply on the right by this permutation tensor, I'll get k tensor product n times the permutation tensor. That'll bring in k tensor product, the transpose of the permutation tensor operating on n. But if you transpose this and operate on n, you're gonna get zero automatically. And then you're gonna get minus beta R transpose epsilon squared. If you, if you take, if you look at the square of this, just multiply this by itself, after a line, you're gonna get minus T1, one plus two, two, minus the parenthesis. That's the negative of the projection onto the discontinuity surface. So with the minus sign, that's just this. So if you now, put that expression into here and remember that beta R transpose operating on the normal was zero, you're gonna get minus beta R transpose on the identity, which is beta R transpose, with the minus signs will cancel out, and you'll just get beta R transpose is the jump in the plastic deformation times this surface permutation object. And the range of this, you know, the input vectors, so if you want to operate this on some vectors, the inputs would be, would be first they'd have, they would encounter this epsilon, which picks up only tangential vectors on the discontinuity surface. It annihilates any normal part of the vector that you input into this operation. The normal part is taken care of by this K tensor product N term. Okay, so we have a way of interpreting the so-called surface dislocation entirely in terms of <clears throat> the orientation of the discontinuity surface. If you know the normal to the discontinuity surface, you simply construct an orthonormal basis as we have done on the discontinuity surface. An arbitrary one, by the way, take an arbitrary orthonormal basis such that T1, 2, and N is right-handed could be any, t, any such T1 and T2. You get a permutation tensor, it's gonna be the same tensor every time. In fact, it's a good exercise for you to verify that no matter how you choose T1 and T2 to be orthonormal, orthonormal with T1, 2, and N right-handed, you will always get the same expression. <clears throat> 
Okay, so this is defined unambiguously. All you have to do is know the orientation of the, the surface of this continuity. If I tell you the jump in the plastic deformation, then the surface dislocation density is completely determined. We can do the same, we've, so far we've done everything in the reference configuration. We can do everything in the current configuration as well. If you remember, <clears throat> This referential Burgess vector is really the same as the spatial one obtained by taking the boundary integral of H inverse d small x, which is the same as K inverse d cap x integrated over the reference image of the material surface. So the, provided that small s is the deformed image of capital S, these, this expression is true. We've seen that before. So this again is a material surface. It's evolving in the current configuration, but it's fixed in the reference. If we do the same procedure, which I won't drag you through again, it's the same exact procedure, we'll get the extended Stokes theorem. We'll get the dislocation density referred to the current configuration with a transpose on top. Small n, that's the normal to the, this, the, the, this material surface in the current configuration. We'll get a small t, which would be tangential to the curve of intersection between this one and the discontinuity surface in the current configuration. Because gamma belongs to this material surface, it's the image of the original gamma that we had before under the deformation. So it's again a material curve. Right? <clears throat> And we induce in that way a spatial subscript t for associated with configuration at time t, spatial uh, surface dislocation tensor, beta super t, su uh, sub t super transpose. And in place of the vector little k we had before, we'll now have a different vector. I'll call it little h based on the normal to the current discontinuity surface. Okay, so same, uh, same result exactly. I won't drag you through it. And you can solve again for the surface dislocation in terms of the discontinuity in H inverse. And there'll be a permutation, two-dimensional permutation tensor on the tangent plane of the current image of the discontinuity surface in the deformed configuration. Okay, well, let's uh, go through this exercise for the standard deformation gradient. Well, <clears throat> if, if the surface capital S is a, uh, can support a discontinuity in the plastic deformation, maybe it can support a discontinuity in the total deformation gradient also. Let's, let's examine that. Well, Let's suppose our deformation is continuous so that the dislocations that exist within it do not cause the body to break, right? So uh, to have a discontinuous deformation, you'd essentially be tearing the body in, in two pieces, right? Suppose we exclude that from the discussion. We're just talking about processes, including plasticity, that can take place without tearing the body in two. So let's consider the case when the deformation is itself continuous, continuous function, even though its gradient f might be discontinuous. So you can have a function that's continuous, but its slope is discontinuous. That's what we're talking about. So such a discontinuity surfaces, the surface, if you look at the asterisk down here, in the literature that's called a coherent interface where the body, the two sides of the discontinuity surface, they cohere with each other. That is, they stick together because the deformation is continuous. But the gradient, let's allow it to be possibly discontinuous. Let's examine that. Well, if we look at Stokes theorem and integrate FDX around the boundary of a material surface, we're going to always get zero. Why? Because FDX is d chi. It's an exact differential. The boundary integral of d chi is just chi at the end of the 
integration minus chi at the beginning, but there's a closed surface, a closed curve. So those beginning and endpoints are the same. And because chi is continuous, the endpoint values will be the same and they'll subtract out to zero. Okay. Nevertheless, we can apply Stokes theorem to this integral. As usual, we get the referential curl of F all transpose operating on the normal to the material surface. And then we have the jump part that we've discussed before. We've just used the same formula, but now for F. And this is our TDU that we, in, in the, that we introduced before. Okay, so we're gonna have this for all material surfaces. Now in this part, this, this part, this is, this is the entire surface take away, uh, take away this intersecting curve gamma, right? So in, the, in this part of the, of the result, we're looking at uh, regions, uh, S, S perpendicular plus and S perpendicular minus, where F is smooth, smooth function. So we can go back to our definition of curl. Curl F is the tensor, which when operating on an arbitrary fixed vector, is the curl of the vector formed by F transpose operating on that fixed vector. So C is fixed. The simplest way to work this out is using Cartesians, let's say. We could use convective, that's fine, but the Cartesian formula will suffice for our purposes. This will be the permutation symbol, ABD, one, zero, minus one, V, D, comma, B, with the Cartesian basis, capital E, A, left over, because we're in the, this is a referential vector, and we're in the, the operation here is referential. So put in V sub D from this expression, that's F, I, D, C, I, take the comma, B, that's a partial with respect to capital X, B, But C is fixed, so in a Cartesian system, its components would also be constants, right? Not so in a curvilinear system. Nevertheless, so we can take the, the CIs won't see the partial derivative. We'll just take them out here as E, small ei dot C. This is the basis in the current configuration, right? And we just have a partial on the deformation gradient components. And then we'll, we recognize the tensor product here, EI dot C is the same as this whole tensor operating on C. Compare this with this, and we get the curl F must be this parenthesis. Remember that F I D comma B, well, that's just chi I comma D comma B, which is symmetric in the subscripts D and B, because we can interchange the order of the differentiation if chi is C2 in these subregions what we talked about. That's symmetric in DB, this is skew symmetric in DB. Double sum will give you automatically zero, okay? So the curl of F is zero in any region where F is, where chi is twice differentiable. What we're left with is then zero is equal to this gamma integral. So zero is the integral along the intersection between the material surface and the discontinuity surface, gamma, of jump F, T, and that's true for all gamma because we can choose the material surface arbitrarily subject to the restriction that it intersects the discontinuity surface, okay? So it's true for all gamma. And for the same, so, so we get the integrand e equals zero at every point on the discontinuity surface. But because the material surface we've chosen in this discussion can be chosen arbitrarily, so can T, the tangent to it, to the, to the discontinuity surface, the same discussion we had before when we talked about surface dislocation. So we have that the jump in F on the tangent is equal to zero for all tangents to the discontinuity surface. So we can do the same trick we did before. 
write f as f times the identity and write the identity using the normal to the discontinuity surface and an, ortho, an, ortho, an orthonormal tangent basis on the discontinuity surface. f on t1 will be zero by this equation. f on t2 will also be zero. And we're just left with f on n, which I'll call vector f, tensor product n. So f itself has a, the jump in f has a very restricted form compared to the jump in the plastic deformation, right? Which has this form, or the jump in K inverse, or jump in G, which has this form, right? F itself has a very restricted representation in which we only have the first part. It has, it has the structure, the jump, the jump in F itself can only be of the form of a vector tensor product N. I don't know what that vector is yet, but it has this structure. And again, is the normal to the discontinuity surface in the reference configuration. Okay. This is, by the way, a, a famous result called Hadamard's lemma. Remember the Legendre Hadamard condition? It's the same Hadamard who came quite a long time after Legendre. Um, in the early 20th century, Adamar was working. This, this expression is fundamental to the study, for example, of shock waves, which are surfaces, propagating surfaces on which de the deformation is continuous. So you're not ripping the body apart, but its gradient is discontinuous. And also, interestingly, the material velocity can also be discontinuous, as we'll see. So this result we've just arrived at is called Hadamard's lemma, and it stipulates that the jump in F on a so-called coherent interface, that is uh, an interface characterized by a continuous deformation but a discontinuous gradient, it stipulates that the jump in F must have this form. This is called a rank one tensor. If, if you remember anything from linear algebra, the rank of a tensor, what you do is you take that tensor operate on any vector, you'll get, for an arbitrary input vectors V, you'll get, you'll get some output vectors A on V. That'll form a, a space, a vector space, and the span of that vector space, that's essentially, that's the, the set of all, the set of all bases in that vector space. The dimension of that, vector space is called the rank of the tensor A. So in our case, if F looks like this, you operate on some arbitrary vector, you're going to get n dot v with F left over. This is just a scalar. This, the, the space of all such objects is spanned by the single vector F, right? because it's just some scalar times that F. And a space spanned by a single vector is one dimensional, so it has dimension one. So this, this, this kind of tensor is called rank one. That plays a huge role in theories of phase transformations and so on, these, this kind of uh, discussion, this discussion about jumps in F and so on. So, that, that puts a severe constraint on the limiting values of the deformation gradient as you approach the discontinuity surface from either side, the plus limit and the minus limit. That's a severe constraint. To require a tensor to be rank one, in, in general, a second order tensor in three dimensional space is rank three, right? As rank three, because the dimension of the, the outputs here is, is three dimensional in general. So. The rank of a general tensor in three space is three, second order tensor in three space. So F, the discontinuity in F is a very restricted kind of tensor. It only has rank one. So that's a pretty severe constraint on the discontinuity. In contrast though, if you look at, let's see this equation here, equation, this equation, this does not have rank one, it has full rank, because if you operate this on an arbitrary vector V, you're gonna get a vector here, and you're gonna get 
two other vectors here. And in general, they'll be linearly independent. So you'll have an arbitrary output vector. In other words, you'll have a three-dimensional image space, which means the jump in H inverse is rank three. Likewise, the jump in the plastic deformation, which, you, which is here, equation two, um, it is a rank three tensor. No restriction on it at all. Why? Because of the possibility of having a surface dislocation, which is absent now in the, in the, in the case of the deformation gradient itself because of this condition here. Okay, so why do we care? Um, so although this is a severe constraint on the limiting values of the deformation gradient on either side of a discontinuity surface, there is no similar constraint on the limiting values of H inverse, let's say, or G for that matter. So let's see why this matters. Well. Let's imagine we have a metal consisting of a polycrystalline metal. So it consists of uh, crystal grains. Within each grain, you have a single crystal. And they're glued together by various forces, let's say. Um, imagine the case when these crystal grains are free of stress. Our constitutive hypotheses from the last one or two lectures were that the strain energy function, the elastic, the strain energy function was positive definite. Remember, we're talking about small strains. The elastic moduli constituted a positive definite fourth order tensor. And with a major symmetry, that's like a positive definite six by six symmetric matrix. So stress-free then, well, well, so let me back up. You can invert that tensor of elastic moduli, we call that the compliance, to get the strain in terms of the stress. So if you have no stress, you also have no elastic strain, which means that the elastic parts of the deformation gradient are rotations. They could be different rotations, but they're rotations under our constitutive hypothesis. Furthermore, that also means the strain energy is zero, right? Because the elastic strains in each crystal grain would be zero, so there's no strain energy under this assumption that the, the grains are individually stress-free. Well, you can see that that can happen if, if you regard this interface between the two grains as a discontinuity surface, which carries, which supports surface dislocation, then the surface dislocation density, say in the current configuration, would be the jump in H inverse, which would be the jump in Q inverse, which is Q transpose because the Qs would be rotations, operating on this two-dimensional permutation tensor on that discontinuity surface. Well, there's no, there's no reason that the discontinuity in the rotation should be zero, and hence no reason that this surface dislocation would be zero. So in order to have stress-free uh, uh, adjacent crystal grains that are stress-free, you will in general have a surface dislocation at the, at the grain boundary, the common interface between the two crystal grains. If you didn't have dislocation, surface dislocation, suppose Suppose it was impossible to have surface dislocation for some strange reason, then beta would be zero. Then H inverse would have the Hadamar form, right? It would boil down to this for some vector H. It would be rank one. So that means, for example, even if one of the crystal grains was stress-free, that is to say, the H in that crystal grain, say the minus one, was a rotation, then the plus part, so this would be the, this, this bracket is the plus value of H inverse minus the minus value. The plus value would be the minus value, which would then be the transpose of this, plus this, 
So even if the, the minus grain was stress-free, the plus grain would have a deformation gradient that looks like this, and this is not in general a rotation. So H plus not being a rotation would mean that the strain in the grain plus, the plus grain, is not zero, which means the stress is also not zero. So this is a, an argument for why surface dislocation plays an important role. It allows adjacent crystal grains to relax to zero energy states, low energy configurations. Right? It allows them to be, to, to exist in low energy configurations. Of course, there'll be other grains interacting here too, which may you know, interfere with this relaxation process. But it, what it does is to facilitate, this, this is really, you can think of as the thermodynamic reason why uh, metals tend to form polycrystalline aggregates in which you have crystal grains coexisting with each other rather than a single crystal throughout because the presence of a grain boundary brings with it the possibility of a surface dislocation which relaxes the restri this restriction that would otherwise be imposed on the elastic deformation gradient and allows the crystals to relax to lower energy states. So since nature likes low energy states in, in, equilibria, in equilibrium, nature prefers polycrystalline aggregates, right? Because then we have the possibility of surface dislocation and hence the attainment of a kind of optimal energy state in the whole sample. Okay, so I've talked a lot about uh, the kinematics of what's going on here, surface dislocation, dislocation density, and so on. So the conventional dislocation density, alpha, is associated with torsion. The surface dislocation density is associated only with the discontinuity in the plastic deformation. And hence, if you look at the plastic deformation, how, is it, how it was defined, that's a discontinuity in the small m vectors, m sub i, right? So the small m i's can be discontinuous. So if you, if you relax our earlier restrictions to allow uh, discontinuities in the small m's, then you allow also surface dislocation. And you can talk about interactions between crystal grains. Okay, um, that's a lot to digest, so I think we'll stop here. Next time, we'll get down to the constitutive structure of the theory in addition to the strain energy and stress that we've already introduced and talk about the notion of dissipation. And you've already had a preview of a kind of a, a simple idea, concept of dissipation in connection with viscosity in your first homework. We'll extend that notion to encompass plastic evolution and talk about constitutive equations starting next time. Okay, so let's stop here unless there are any questions. And if not, then I will see you on Monday and Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, have a good one.